John Lopez, congratulations on Paradise City. Can you just start off describing the film for us? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, it's it's really about uh, three men from different walks of life that that cross paths and find themselves being targeted and attacked by uh, rogue systems of authority and uh, the different actions that they take to kind of push back against these forces. And uh, and then we along the way, we see them go through, you know, they, spiritual questions and, and questions of real life, moral and ethical kind of qu- uh, conflicts. So I wanted to kind of explore that and also uh, just just take a snapshot of the of the era, right, right before Corona. So we call it like, you know, two, 2018 B.C. before Corona and, and just kind of see where the state of the country and it seems like the world was right before that. So it could be, uh, you know, uh, income inequality gap getting wider and wider, homelessness uh, becoming more pervasive, uh, you know, police brutality, all these things that were coming on at once. And I wanted to take a snapshot of it before, uh, you know, the, the decade ended. Okay. Another theme in the film that you address very directly is the issue of Islam. Can you tell me what your intentions were there? Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, so again, these are, uh, I took, even though the film is fictional, I took uh, real life stories of how some of these people, at least in New York, uh, found themselves uh, being targeted by law enforcement. And uh, and they were like, the law, the law enforcement agents that were in there undercover were trying to entrap some of these individuals that actually had no intention whatsoever of committing any acts of terrorism or even thinking of, of along those lines. So I thought, I thought that was an inch. I thought that was fertile ground for for drama and and for a film to to explore kind of that that issue there. I thought it was fascinating. Now, with that issue, it yeah. seems like you're making a very specific point uh, about Islam and about Islamic extremist violence. You have a character in there who, I presume, is giving voice to what you strongly feel about the importance of distinguishing Muslim people and those who commit acts of violence in the name of Islam. Is that the case? Yes, I am trying to distinguish between um, average, normal, working class citizens, in this case, American citizens, who are just trying to go about their day and they're not trying to cause any problems. And of course, there's bad apples in every walks of life, whether it's police or even in radical Islam. Uh, and by no means am I trying to, uh, you know, say that that doesn't exist. What I'm trying to focus on is the average everyday people who actually are just trying to go along with their day and and, and pray and, and just be lawful citizens. But they find themselves sometimes in some cases, uh, you know, lured in by uh, entrapment for whatever reasons that these systems of authority are trying to, to justify. It, does that answer your question at all? Uh, yes, it does, because it's very interesting that this is an important theme that you're pursuing in your film we're not seeing the equivalent in mainstream film, at least not yet. Um, I'm wondering whether it's the case that being an independent filmmaker, you feel that you can address these issues that you've mentioned more directly and more honestly than might be the case uh, if it was a bigger production. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, these are these are really sensitive uh subject matters to explore and uh and i can understand the uh the apprehension that a a larger hollywood studio would have but as an independent filmmaker uh and since we're working it's such an independent kind of grassroots you know filmmaking process we're able to we're able to dive in and, and look under rocks that normally uh other larger institutions probably wouldn't want to touch so that's kind of the luxury that independent filmmakers get to get we get to kind of you know, go into the dark corners and look around and, and, and kind of explore. So absolutely, you're right about that. You say you wanted to capture a snapshot of, well, New York at least, at this particular point in time. Where did the idea for this come from? Why did you want to do it? Yeah, great question. Um, 
again, so it, it comes from just uh, real life stories that I was hearing. And uh, I, I heard it firsthand accounts of guys telling me uh, that they had seen undercover agents in their in their mosque or, or in their community centers talking about, uh, you know, these these subject matters that otherwise they had no interest in. And and then you would see guys actually get arrested. And um, and then again, I would you know, you walk around and you see homelessness and you see like a larger income wealth distribution. And of course, some of what you've heard, of course, with Black Lives Matter is, uh, you know, some of this police brutality. So I kind of I wanted to really take a look at these vulnerable communities and see and see if I could interweave these characters together in, a, in an entertaining and cinematic way. Tell me what your purpose is as a filmmaker. I mean, you could have made a rom-com. You could have made a comedy. <laughs> you could have made any other type of film. Can you just tell That's me? My, that, that'll be my next one. Jim. That'll be my next one in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> mate, just tell me a little bit rom -com about... Rom-com in, in Perth. Are you in Perth? No, I'm in Melbourne, mate. Melbourne. <laughs> um, so just yeah. tell me a bit um, about your motivations as an artist, about what drives you, what it is you want to explore, uh, and what your artistic uh, guiding principles are. Yeah, I think uh, some of the some of my favorite filmmakers, you know, just t like Sidney Lumet, for instance, is a guy who would explore in the late 70s, early 80s, he was exploring these these really kind of taboo and third rail subject matters in New York uh, at the time when when other when other kind of larger kind of stories were not trying to, to, to explore that. Right. So I like to I like to at least show audiences like yourself, Jim, uh, you know, perspectives that normally don't get seen and don't get viewed or, or talked about. So if I can at least spark a conversation or at least show you uh, or people anywhere in, a more, in, a, in the country uh, a side of life, a slice of life that they normally wouldn't see or nor know about, uh, uh, that to me, I think, is, is really interesting and, and worth, worth exploring. I have to say that I've fallen a little bit in love with you because of what you just said about Sidney Lumet. <laughs> I, I was, it was just this morning, I was thinking yeah. about a film called Prince of the City that he made with Trent Williams. Oh my God. So you're a big Sidney Lumet fan. That film in particular was one of the inspirations for this, for this project. And uh, again, because we're exploring a police officer that is in a world that he, he didn't expect. And he, he finds that there's a lot of corruption and uh, issues that he's that he finds morally, uh, you know, uh, contempt, contemption for. So he he, how do you react to that when when all all of your fellow police officers are 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 conducting themselves in a way that, you know, is immoral or unjust? So, absolutely, Prince of the City and Sidney Lumet was a massive influence for me. Um, Serpico, Serpico was another example. Uh, an undercover cop, a cop who finds himself, you know, at odds with with his with his fellow police officers. I think I think those stories are fascinating to me, and that was something I was trying to emulate as best as I could. Now, mate, can you just tell me a bit about the nuts and bolts of making the film? Uh, how long it took for you to actually shoot it, uh, to pre-produce it, and to write it, and ultimately how you actually raised the money? Can you just give us a a profile oh, about the film? Oh man, yeah, that process was almost as brutal as uh, you know anything I've ever done before. It's so, as you can see, it's it's a very ambitious project for an independent film. So the question was how do, how could we cram all of that, all those action set pieces, the extras, the multiple locations, the ensemble cast? It, it was a real challenge to try to um, to make that to manifest that with hardly any money, right? So. In New York, thankfully, I have a lot of, you know, production allies and amazing craftsmen that were willing to come out, you know, just because they were passionate about the project or, or that they believed in me. And uh, yeah, and, and since when you have, when you don't have the resources that Hollywood, you know, filmmakers have, you, you have to really uh, find creative solutions where it's like, okay, we're going to go shoot we're going to go shoot in this, uh, my buddy's apartment. We're going to go shoot at, uh, my old, uh, high school, you know, we're going to borrow. That's a real mosque that, that, uh, one of our actors, uh, goes to. And he asked his Iman if we could shoot there. And the guy said, yes. 
So you just have to find really creative solutions and kind of be a, like MacGyver type filmmakers to to really kind of stretch the budget as far as you can. And can you give me an idea about how you raise the money and if you're allowed to tell me how much the film cost? Because if my understanding is correct, in Australia there is access to government money, uh, whereas in America you don't have that system. There are grants Amen. here and there, but overall you are on your own when it comes to raising the finances. <laughs> is that true? <laughs> Oh man, I trust me. There's so many times I wish I was I was a French filmmaker and and being funded by the government or a Canadian uh, director, right? Because they get grants uh, here in the states. Unfortunately, you're on your own. Uh, you know, especially if you're an independent grassroots filmmaker, you, you you're kind of on your own. So again, a lot of it. Uh, I'm a com I do commercials for a living. I'm a commercial director. I do advertising. So. Uh, a lot of that money comes from my from the work I do in advertising, and then again, just going around hat in hand to to private investors, and uh, you know, showing them clips of the movie, showing them trailers, and getting them excited and passionate about the project. So yeah, it's it's a real like I said, it's a real grassroots effort, okay? Because this is operating outside the Hollywood system, unfortunately. So it's tough. And again, when that happens, the, the production goes longer. So it goes into like a year, a year and a half, two years when you don't have the money to do it all in like two months. And, and how long was the shoot for this film? So principal photography was about a month. Uh, but then we went back out uh, six months later and shot again for another five days. And then we went back out again another three months later and shot for an extra four days. So it became it became a little bit of a kind of guerrilla warfare you know when you're out there you know dealing with the elements right and just trying to survive <laughs> and what has been the life of the film how has it played what kind of reaction has it received yeah um so well the film just came out uh, on digital release uh, about a month ago and uh, we're, we're lucky to be on amazon uh we're on uh, Pluto, iTunes, uh, so much more. We're just really thankful that the film is up there and people can watch it. That's a blessing in and of itself because so many films just go unseen. Um, so thus far, the, the, the film um, has gotten real positive feedback. Again, it's like you mentioned before, Jim, it's not what you normally see for, from Hollywood productions. This is, a, this, is, this is a different slice of life that we're that we're exploring it's a different uh it's a more in your face style of of cinema right it's it's um it harkens back to the 70s what i was hoping for with sydney lumet films it's a little bit more uh gritty it's it's grittier it's it's not as polished as you know these you know like a you know like a beauty and the beast disney film it's not it's not intended for that it's really supposed to be in the streets with working class people and uh, kind of exploring their world. And John, you're a fair, fairly young guy. Can you tell me how old you are? I just turned 36 okay. uh, a few weeks ago. Okay, yeah. so, so, <laughs> so. You, you're, a, you're a young, talented filmmaker growing up in the Thank digital you, age and with access to digital platforms. How conscious are you that your film in a previous era would have had a lot of trouble, might have played at a couple of festivals and then basically would have disappeared into oblivion. Are you conscious that the platforms that you have uh, on, on streaming channels and so on, that this actually is a huge boon and a huge advantage that you have over the independent filmmakers of previous generations. Absolutely, Jim. Um, absolutely. It's a, it's a blessing and a curse. It's a double-edged sword, actually, Jim, because um, now that there's, I call it the democratization of film. So now that you know ch cameras are cheaper and there's so many streaming platforms, you're up against a lot more competition as well. So everyone's fighting for eyeballs whether it's on YouTube or Netflix or Hulu or HBO. But at the same time, you do have a you do have an opportunity that wasn't there back in the 70s or 80s or even in the 90s. So a filmmaker like me 
can 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 shoot on a digital camera and put it up on on the internet and 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 share it with friends and family and someone in Australia can watch it, which is pretty incredible. I would never imagine that in my life, right? So it's it's a blessing, but it's also challenging because you're up against so much. The competition now is even wider than it's ever been. And just a quick tech question: Can I ask what you shot on? What did you film this with? Yeah, this was a this was on an Alexa. Uh, yep. We had two Alexas on set, um, and my DP, thankfully, uh, I love him to death. He was one of the camera operators on the Joker uh, that recently came out with Joaquin Phoenix. Uh, he specifically shot that scene when uh, Joaquin was on the stairs. Okay. He was what he was the second camera. <laughs> yeah, so he's a union DP, and he he was willing, you know, because I've made three films with him now. How he, did you get like, him? Really... Can you can you just explain? Oh, that? He's a friend of mine. He, he's, okay. He's good. He's a good friend. He's a good buddy of mine. Uh, we've done a lot of stuff over the years, music videos, you, you name it. Uh, and yeah, he's just, he's, he believes in, in the work that, that we're trying to do. So I'm, okay. I'm really grateful for, for Christopher Raymond and Ruben Kujal, who also shot for us. Sure. So basically, the pulling of favors and the friendships that you have and the networks that you've personally developed are very important when you're making a film such as this oh, because uh, there's a lot of a uh, lo lot of value in those favors i guess oh my goodness like it's like the old saying it takes a village to raise a child i feel the same way about independent film you really it's it's honestly i'm just a small piece of this larger effort and there's a few key allies that have been with me from the very beginning this is my third feature film uh, my brother, who's, who's the executive producer, again, you know, he keeps the ship afloat um, while I'm out there just like, you know, in in with the actors. He's he's taking care of everything else to keep the ship going. My editor, uh, Paul Sanfilippo, uh, my composer, Zach Engel, who's just absolutely a super talent. I'm just so incredibly grateful that he's even willing to, to participate. Um, yeah, and then so many more. Christopher Raymond, our DP, Ruben Kajala, who also shot for us. Uh, there's so many people along the way that I'm grateful for, and and without them, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So I, I'm just blessed to have these guys on my side. In terms of the performances, I thought some of them were good, um, but I'm wondering if there were occasions where you would have liked a bit more rehearsal time or a bit more prep time, because I know that you were using uh, a lot of non-professional actors in this yeah. uh yes absolutely uh but yeah more uh, obviously more time uh you know we're dealing with limited we're running gun we're dealing with limited time and resources we're up against the gun um and again there's some of these people was the first time they've ever acted as well and i was i was trying to capture uh real the sense of realism and authenticity uh, the gentleman who uh, who who plays Brother Nazim, who's in the mosque, the Iman, yeah, he's never acted before. He's never acted before, so I don't know if um, you know that performance was uh, was was interesting or not. But I thought he brought something uh, compelling to yeah. the role because that he that's really him. He really yeah. was an ex convict. He really was an ex convict, mm -hmm. and he rehabilitated himself, and now he works with with you know, juveniles in the community. So I wanted that authenticity. The other thing I wanted to mention was just regarding the plot and the sister side of the story, which I felt was might, might have been a bit overcooked, especially given what happens to the dog. I mean, you actually break one of the rules <laughs> of filmmaking uh, about, about treating how you treat dogs in movies. And um, I'm wondering whether, oh, yeah. on reflection, that that side of the story might have worked better had it been toned down and had she not been such an extreme character. Yeah, uh, that's that's certainly uh, discussions that that we had, and it was a uh, it, it, that moment in particular was very uh, difficult to uh, to capture. Absolutely, and. Um, it, it definitely does not. Uh, it's it's not the the happiest moment for sure in the film. Um, and yeah, though again, I wanted to push the envelope on this film. I wanted to really toe like come to the edge and see how far I could go. 
And, uh, and that's a fair assessment. Uh, if people have that assessment, that's, that's more than fair. But I, that was my intention. I, I really wanted to go as far as I could. Um, and, and if things sometimes felt a little overcooked or, or I fell flat on my face, that's perfectly fine. As an artist, I wanted to go as far as I could and see where, see where the lines were. Right. So that when I come back again in my third, my fourth, fifth or sixth film, I'll know where these where the, you know, the parameters are. And John, where do you want to go? Do you want to end up working at a studio? Are you happy to stay in the independent realm? What's your ambition? Yeah, I think in a perfect world, I'll, I'll be somewhere in the middle in the perfect world, because because, uh, again, I don't know if, um, you know, the. The, the big studio films, because again, it's it, when you get there, it really becomes creative by committee. And you have maybe 30 people telling you, you know, how to make what to do, who to cast. And I still like to have that that free that free spirit, that free energy to kind of explore things that they otherwise may not want to. So uh, I would like to land somewhere in the middle, if that makes sense. For sure. <laughs> Can you just tell me a bit more about how uh, you make your living. You say you work as a as a director of commercials. Can you tell us a bit more about that? About some of the ads you've done that we might have even maybe seen here. Yeah. Um, well, I spent a long time in advertising um, as a producer at one of the largest advertising agencies, and and that allowed me to kind of uh, jump ship and start shooting commercials for brands like Heineken. Cadillac, uh, did a McDonald's spot. So yeah, that the advertising world, it may not be the most, uh, you know, fruitful, uh, artistic expression, but it does pay the bills. Okay. So, uh, for me, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy to, to keep doing that. Right. So, so, so I can make films so I can continue making these independent films. Yeah.